So this is the first Cas uh, Casaleño lectures. So as usual, uh, you start with the lecture and then we have the discussion. Good, thank you. So um, in sketching the so-called projection strategy that I talked about mainly last time, um, I emphasized the notion of causal independence and giving the examples, for example, the Goodman's or way of thinking about dispositional properties that we'll talk more about next time and in particular the uh, attempt to sort of explain the notion of chance in the way I was suggesting, causal independence played a central role. It also plays, um, I, mean, I, I think it's intuitively a more robust a uh, simpler relation than causation itself. Causation is complicated, uh, exactly, and, and a lot of controversy about um, uh, even given uh, notions of causal independence, although they obviously constrain the notion of causation, they don't um, yield a definition of it. So it's, a, I think, a, a more basic notion. It's also the role, epistemological, the role in epistemological reasoning of a notion, notions of causal independence, for example, in uh, the whole idea of, of random samples and uh, 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 other sort of more specific kind of inductive methods that play a role in both common sense and scientific reasoning um, involve the notion of causal uh, uh, independence. And uh, also, finally, the notion of causal independence uh, is intuitively um, uh, a closeness or a yields a closeness uh, relation or similarity relation of the kind that's relevant to the interpretation of um, counterfactuals. It doesn't yield a reductive account of one, but uh, the, it, it does connect up with intuitions about closeness of possible worlds. So the, the rough, the main idea, at least as I thought of it, always thought of it, of um, the idea that you pick the closest possible world or a closest possible world is the idea that you make no, in, in constructing a conception of the counterfactual world, you leave everything the same except what's needed to change. Um, to make the antecedent true. So if you think in this sort of intuitively, um, uh, not as sort of selecting a world so much as constructing one, although that's, that's um, not something one doesn't want to take too seriously, but um, uh, constructing a conception of a world, you want to leave uh, everything the same, tweak the world to make the antecedent true, but leave everything that you don't need to change uh, the way it is. But what does it mean to be something you need to change? That's the whole problem because you always are changing some things and leaving other things uh, the same no matter how you do it. Um, so the idea of causal independence plays a role. So obviously if something is independent of the antecedent, has no plays no role in um, uh, in uh, the so causal chains involved in the events that one is changing counterfactually, then one leaves um, everything the same uh, that isn't uh, necessary to, uh, to do that in the, in the sort of um, effects of the, um, uh, of, of the antecedent. Now again, there's no explanation, but it's just a connection of intuitions with some other things. And in general, the strategy the non-reductive strategy um, is not to reduce the notion to something more basic, but maybe in some ways the other way around. That is, if we find a central notion, which itself is one of the problematic ones, that, that and, and we can, if we can explain a lot in terms of it, uh, a lot both of the function of counterfactual reasoning and so on, and uh, uh, and use it to help analyze other notions, then we clarify a concept by using it to clarify or to connect with other uh, concepts. So that's the general uh, 
kind of strategy. More methodologically, um, uh, the, the strategy as contrasted with a reductive strategy is going to be piecemeal. So the best way to try to, one, one good way to try to clarify uh, the difficult concepts we're interested in is to find specific models uh, which concern a particular kind of application. Um, they off, they normally, if you want to be precise, as we do, um, but there's always trade-offs in, in being precise, so you use models that are highly artificial and idealized in some cases, but ones that are um, concern a specific kind of issue. Uh, and then see what you can do in explaining how counterfactuals work in that limited um, artificial or, or idealized uh, context. And we'll see that when you do that, it raises some problems of interest and also helps to clarify what's going on in a more general uh, case, or at least that's the, the hope. So um, causal independence plays a role I emphasize in epistemic reasoning, but it also plays a central role in practical reasoning, and that's going to be the main focus, and that's the kind of uh, models I want to talk about today is, again, artificial models of decision making as developed by theory, theorists who aren't focused in particular on counterfactuals. They're focused on um, the task of Bayesian decision making. Um, but uh, there's lots of causal and counterfactual information uh, presupposed implicitly in the characterization of, um, of uh, in particular of games, but more generally of, of um, decisions. So a game, in the game theoretic sense of a game, is a sequence of decision problems. Um, and the definition of a game imposes uh, a lot of causal structure. It's a sequence, so we have a process, an evolving process, in the course of the play of a game with causal influences and causal independence involved in characterizing the flow of information and the uh, flow of decision making uh, in the course of, um, of such a uh, complex of decision um, problems. So I want to look uh, today, talk um, first of all by just some exposition and contrast of some alternative versions of decision theory which which contrast with each other in virtue of the role they, uh, they, uh, they give to causal structure in the characterization of uh, what, uh, uh, what's involved in rational decision making. Um, so we'll look first at, at uh, different versions of this so-called causal decision theory versus evidential decision theory briefly, and then, uh, and then look at, at the third uh, framework for decision theory which is connected, namely game theory, and think of game theory as a kind of application of causal decision theory. Um, in the end, um, what I want to do is uh, raise a puzzle, a problem, about the relationship between determinism and the kinds of structures that um, that are developed in, um, in uh, the case of uh, modeling decision making, uh, a, a, a tension between determinism and, uh, and these structures, uh, which are also involved in, um, uh, in the concept of chance. We'll look at the relationship between, I mean, the familiar. Um, philosophical problem of uh, the conflict of determinism and free will uh, is uh, the most prominent focus of this kind of problem, but there's a more general problem about the relationship between uh, counterfactual, uh, counterfactuals and determinism, um, which uh, I think uh, it helps to look at um, in um, uh, to look at the relationship between the more general problem and the more specific problems about uh, decision making uh, and free action. Okay, so to jump in by first just uh, looking 
uh, at the basic ideas of Bayesian decision theory and see how um, causal structure is involved from the start, really, of the formulations of these, um, these theories. And I'll talk about causation or causal independence, um, but, um, uh, but it's implicit in the development of, of the theory. So start off with the idea, the basic idea of all versions of Bayesian decision theory is when faced with a decision problem, this is the start of the handout here, um, the outcome will depend on two things, two interacting things. First, um, what are the alternative available actions to be chosen? So basically, you think of what the theory is telling you is what do we need to, kn to know to have a decision problem? And what are the resources that the agent needs, the epistemic uh, and other resources, uh, mental resources, in order to, uh, for it to make sense to assess the agent's action as a rational action, as the right thing, rational thing to do, a relative to something, relative to what? So the decision theory is going to spell out what we need to assume in order to uh, what, what uh, assumptions we need to make in order to have a context in which we can uh, specify what's rational. Um, okay, so we're, I mean, uh, in a realistic situation, it's going to be difficult to say, well, what, what are my options? What, what can I do in a, in a particular situation? But in giving a kind of artificial model, you say the first thing to do is to get um, uh, an understanding of what you regard your options to be, and the theory will assume that you know what your options uh, are, what you can do, uh, what's available to you um, to do. Uh, the outcome of your action, the outcome of your choice, which of the alternatives you choose, um, the outcome will depend uh, not just on what you choose, but also on facts with, uh, in the world, which may include unknown facts about the world on which the outcome depends. So um, if you choose to accept a bet um, on a certain flip of a coin, then you know that the outcome will be either you win um, uh, and, and wind up richer than you were uh, before making the bet, or you lose, winding up poorer. So you accept the bet by paying the, uh, down the uh, uh, amount you need, and, uh, and then you either win or you lose. So the outcome, the good or the bad outcome, depends on um, a fact which, over which you have no control. That is, you have control over whether to bet or not, but you don't have control about whether the coin lands heads or tails. Maybe you have control over whether the coin will be flipped, because it will be flipped unless you bet. But um, uh, once you choose the bet, the, um, the outcome of the coin is not affected uh, by, by that. Um, OK, so the, the, that's the very rough intuitive idea. And then you say, OK, so what we need is a characterization of two things. What are the available options? And what are the possible states of the world um, um, uh, states which uh, characterize the relevant facts uh, about which you may be ignorant. Since you may be ignorant of them, what you need in addition, since obviously it doesn't matter just, uh, I mean, whether you win or lose depends partly on what you think about the coin, uh, that is what your beliefs are about the coin. So you have partial beliefs, probability beliefs, uh, subjective credences or subjective probabilities uh, in, um, in the uh, uh, relevant facts. So you specify uh, a probability function which represents, in defining the decision problem, uh, which represents um, your ignorance, uh, your degrees of belief about the alternative states of the world on which your outcome, the outcome of your choice, will depend. Okay, so um, if there are, say, three alternative actions and four alternative states, 
then you can take each of the pairs consisting of an action and a state and ask what's the outcome or the consequence of that pair. If, if you do choose action A in situation S, uh, what, uh, what do you get? What happens? Or what value do you put on that? So you've got to specify the values for the consequences of your possible consequences of your action, probabilities on the states of the world, that where states are understood as causally independent, um, uh, in particular causally uh, situations about the world which are causally independent of your action choice. So you have a kind of two-dimensional uh, two matrix uh, with actions on one dimension and states on the other with the utility values of the consequences uh, uh, written in the boxes in the, in the matrix. So then how do you decide because the action does well, sometimes not well others, and you say take the, um, uh, what, what you should choose is the action that gives you the best expected utility, expected value, expected desirability, whatever you want to call it, um, where expectation is understood in a usual way in, as in statistics um, as a weighted average. So uh, you have a weighted average of, um, uh, of um, uh, um, the value of an action will be a weighted average of the values of the outcomes weighted by um, the, uh, the, the probability or credence in the state. So if you think the coin is um, heavily biased or maybe two-thirds, one-third biased for heads, then uh, your degree of belief will be two-thirds that it will land heads and one-third that it will land tails. So you're going to bet on heads if you bet. And um, your, your, your action uh, would, be, uh, would depend on what the odds are. That is, what, what do you win if it's heads and what do you lose if it's tails? And you would just take the weighted average. So that's the standard general characterization. And I'm describing this in terms of states and actions using the terminology introduced by uh, Leonard Savage, who, um, um, whose version of Bayesian decision theory was the, is the most sort of influential among uh, statisticians uh, or applying these uh, Bayesian techniques to statistical um, reasoning. Um, so central, I mean, the thing I want to emphasize here is central to this way of thinking about decision theory is um, uh, a, a notion of causal uh, independence, uh, that uh, one finds features of the world. Uh, some features of the world will be affected by your actions. Others will be unaffected. And states will be the state of the world that's unaffected by your action. Um, Okay, so that's, but when, when Savage spelled out this version of decision theory, it was a very, uh, I mean, uh, it, it was not a, uh, I mean, it was designed partly to motivate certain representation theorems, um, but uh, the formalism was intuitively uh, quite artificial in certain ways, in particular the notion of an act or an action was simply defined. We had the primitive notions were notions of consequence with the outcome, possible outcomes. What do you get in the end? On the one hand, and um, and uh, actions, or rather states, on the other. So states were primitive, consequences were primitive. Action, acts were just functions from um, from states to consequences. So it's clear that uh, if you think of it in the way I described it, it's sort of a matrix, you can say, well, if you start with the consequence and, um, and, the, and the state, then each act will uh, determine a function from states to consequences uh, because you just look at each of the states and ask what, um, uh, what are the consequences for that state.
But of course, acts are not some kind of artificial function. What they are is things you do. So um, it's a more sort of elegant and uniform formulation would treat actions, states, and consequences all as, um, uh, as facts about the world. So it's a fact about the world that you choose one action rather than another. It's a fact about the world that it's in this state or that state. And the two things together determine a fact about what the consequences are of your, of your action. So um, uh, Richard Jeffrey uh, was um, not happy with not just the inelegance of the savage framework, but also with the role played by causal notions, being a um, an empiricist uh, who is skeptical of causal concepts. So his formulation of decision theory tried to avoid any reference to causal uh, notions. And it also provided you with a kind of uniform framework. So you start with, with for Jeffrey's formulation of decision theory, you start with, um, with a, a state space which is the same as a state of a set of possible worlds. Uh, don't, I'm not necessarily sort of complete possible worlds, but just sort of a partition um, of the possible states of the world uh, into all the relevantly different ways things could go. So uh, in terms of the, um, the sort of model here. So you think of a, this rectangle representing the state space and each action should be thought of as a proposition. The, the proposition which is true in worlds in which you choose that action. Okay, and then the savage kind of notion of states cuts across, and the consequences are, so you say, um, you put in a, a number here, a utility value, and so on, and then take the, and then you have a probability assignment here, uh, in Savage's theory, in, in Jeffrey's version of the theory, forget some specific identified partition of states, and just think of a state space uh, with divided into actions. Then take any proposition, so I'll draw one without the states here, we have take any proposition represented by uh, some um, um, some subset of the space and we can say, what is the value of this proposition? So to any proposition at all, including an action proposition or um, something that has some causal properties uh, or whatever, take any proposition, the Bayesian decision theory will be defined in Jeffrey's theory independently of any assumptions about the relationship between these propositions and, and this other one. So, but the same principle of, uh, of expected value is, uh, is applied. So you say, uh, we, each subset of the space of possibilities has a value, a utility value. So there's no sort of one thing that's the consequences. Um, there are um, uh, any proposition uh, you can say, what is the value of that proposition? Now, the value of a proposition depends entirely on how it is, for uh, intuitively, on how it is realized. So if I say, um, uh, consider um, um, the proposition that um, it's, um, um, uh, that we go on a picnic tomorrow or something like that, and I say, well, 
Uh, if it rains, that'll be a big mistake. Uh, so, um, um, it, it's, so it'll have a low value in the context where it rains, and it'll have a higher value in the context where it doesn't. So in general, take any proposition, quite independently of any actions or anything else, and say the basic rule is that the value of this proposition is a weighted average of the value of its subsets. So uh, and uh, we don't start with sort of values assigned to cells, primitive cells or worlds or anything like that. We start simply with the constraint in your value theory that, um, that the value of, um, of a proposition is a function of the ways it could be realized. Um, so that's a global constraint on, uh, on utility. But in the particular case where we're looking at this um, proposition and these values, um, then uh, the value of this proposition will be a weighted average of these weighted by the probability of that. So you can see the Savage theory is a, really a, a special case of, um, of Jeffrey. Jeffrey's a kind of a generalization of it, which, which uh, but the point is that um, you could, uh, you don't need to make any causal assumptions. There's no particular partition of the space into states um, that plays a, a special role. So causal independence is playing no role in Jeffrey's theory. Uh, okay, so in this context, we have a kind of inelegant um, but in interesting causally loaded uh, version of decision theory, a much more um, streamlined uh, theory formally, but also leaching out the causal assumptions in, in the theory from, from Jeffrey. And this, uh, and it's interesting that philosophy, I mean, it's sociologically interesting that the um, philosophers were often brought up on Jeffrey after he wrote his logic of decision. And that was what they thought of as basic causal decision theory, or basic uh, version of Bayesian decision theory. Whereas statisticians didn't pay a lot of attention to Jeffrey. They uh, were brought up on the savage kind of way of thinking, or on some alternatives uh, um, to it. But then David Lewis comes along and uh, formulates what really, in the end, is a version of um, Savage's theory with respect to um, uh, with respect to the significance given to causal notions, but um, formulated in a kind of framework which is more like Jeffrey's framework. And as, as Lewis and other sort of developers and defenders of so-called causal decision theory that came later, um, um, you can, uh, Lewis thought of, um, of Jeffrey's theory as a value theory, not a decision theory. So if you want to say, you can reasonably say for any proposition uh, that you might learn, say, how good is the news for you? that that proposition is true. So suppose you just learned that um, 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 you missed your airplane, right? Is that good news or bad news? Well, bad news. But there's a piece of that proposition, uh, a, a subset of that proposition, which it's good news, namely the one where the plane crashes. And, uh, so there's a possible world where you miss the plane and it crashes, in which case you're, uh, you put a high value on that. Uh, cases where uh, everything goes normally uh, and uh, you would have um, reached home um, uh, earlier and less inconveniently uh, is good news. Um, so, uh, in general, you can ask simply about the value of a proposition that might be realized in alternative ways and say, well, whether it's good news or bad news that that proposition, if you were to learn that that proposition is true, uh, would, be, um, would be a matter uh, of 
a variation from case to case, but the overall thing is say, well, I'm almost certain that the bad uh, outcome won't happen because you know we, we take for granted that it's extremely unlikely that the plane's going to crash. That's why we take them. Um, so the probabilities uh, of the alternative ways which the proposition can be realized are themselves playing uh, a central role in evaluating the proposition simply as a fact, as a, as a possible fact. So Jeffrey's value theory uh, is uh, defined quite generally, not just for acts, but for anything. But um, given uh, that acts themselves, the actions that are available to you, are propositions, or representative propositions, the proposition that you perform that action, that you choose that action, um, so the value theory tells you what is the value of an action. What if you learned, um, maybe you forgot what you did, but you learned that you chose action A1. And, is that, and then you can ask, is that good news or bad news? Saying you know everything that you knew at the time you made the choice. Um, so uh, uh, Jeffrey's decision theory says choose your actions by choosing the option that would be the best news if you learned it, that you did it. So the evaluation of passive um, uh, propositions, the assessment of the value of a proposition, is the same as the, whether the proposition is in action or, or not. So what Lewis does is say, I want to buy Jeffrey's value theory, but reject his decision theory, saying don't, uh, don't choose an action as the one that would be the best news, but choose the action that would tend to cause, uh, or would, if, if you were to choose it, it would bring about uh, a, a situation that's better than what would be brought about according to your assessment of what would, uh, what would happen. So, if you just put the, co uh, the contrast uh, starkly, one of the ways to put it is to say uh, the uh, expected uh, utility of an action, say there are two, st uh, uh, we, we divide um, uh, the possibilities into two uh, parts, um, 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 S or not S, uh, and we say it's the value of A and S times the um, credence, the probability of uh, the part of A uh, which is in uh, no. plus um, the probability of not S times the value of A and not S. Okay, so take a weighted average um, relative to S, where S is any uh, way of dividing the thing at all. Uh, Lewis's formulation doesn't appeal in some versions to a particular notion of state, rather says instead of the probability, um, uh, the conditional probability, which is an epistemic notion, we should take it uh, to be, and this is exponential, just one way of uh, understanding it, the probability um, for the agent of um, the counterfactual uh, times the probability of okay so 
Um, the contrast between Lewis's theory or ver other versions of it is for Jeffrey, we take a purely evidential relation, and for uh, Lewis, we take a causal, uh, a counterfactual dependence relation. If it turned out that you know that the, you're dealing with savage-like states which you know to be causally independent, then these two things will be the same. But in general, they will be uh, possibly uh, different. Okay, so which version is, is right? And this is where the causal decision theory in particular was designed uh, with uh, a certain particular very famous decision problem in mind. And it's interesting, the decision problem was formulated, which is Newcomb's problem, formulated by Robert Nozick, uh, who was very much uh, taking, get Jeffrey's theory to be the uh, the right theory, or the rather not the right theory, but the sort of given or, or standard theory of decision, Bayesian decision theory. So um, uh, Robert Nozick posed the problem as one that suggested that at least on a certain way of thinking, um, Jeffrey's theory yielded the wrong conclusion. Okay, so let me um, sketch the um, the, the Newcomb problem, uh, for most people will probably be um, familiar with it. It's been around for a long time. Um, and uh, it's something that uh, uh, created uh, controversy because, first of all, the intuitions about the example vary from case to case, and also uh, exactly what the theoretical um, uh, consequences are is something you can debate. Okay, so but just to quickly describe the problem and then you can think about what you think about this. You're presented with two boxes, uh, an opaque box that contains either a million dollars or nothing, and a transparent box that contains, as you can see, a thousand euros. What did I say? A million euros, right, and a, and a thousand euros. Your options are, first, take just one box, just the opaque box. Uh, forego taking the transparent box. That's one option. Your second uh, option available to you is to take them both, take the contents of both. Um, the money is already in the opaque box or not. Um, so uh, your choice, and this is the causal assumption, your choice has no causal effect on the amount of money in the box. Uh, the amount of money in the box is causally independent of your choice. So if you think in savages terms, it's a state of the world that the money is there or it's not. And you have to think, what are your degrees of belief about that state of the world if you're thinking in savages way or in Lewis's way? So then the final part of the story is how is it determined uh, whether the box contains a million dollars or not? And the answer is a predictor who is actually very good, very reliable, uh, predicted what choice you would make. And on the basis of her prediction, uh, she put a million in the box if she chose that you would pick just one. And she put nothing in the box if she chose that you would uh, if she predicted that you would choose both. Um, now, the story about the predictor is the predictor is not, um, not um, someone with magical powers. It's not someone who can see into the future. So there's no idea of causal influence of the future on the past. Uh, it's rather that uh, the, uh, there have been extensive psychological research done on this problem, and uh, it's turned out to be very highly correlated with a certain score on a personality test or a cognitive test of some kind, uh, which you have taken, although you didn't know anything about the problem at the time you took it. Um, and uh, uh, so the predictor based her prediction on um, the results of your, uh, uh, your test. But you have no idea, initially, 
uh, what a uh, test result was, or even what the test was uh, important in it, and so on, all you know is the problem you've just been given. And, and, uh, and the evidence which everybody is given, who has this problem, has faced this problem in the, in the evidential base, uh, knowing that you, um, uh, knowing what the, uh, 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 the, the predictor has been very reliable based on, 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 the, on this kind of evidence. So the argument is that if you go with Jeffrey's decision theory, then you say that conditional on learning, on, uh, on the choice of picking both boxes, um, that gives you high evidence, a great evidence that you are, um, that uh, if you choose one by the year, the one box type, and so probably the predictor put the money in there. So your, your conditional probability on the choose just one choice uh, is high that the money's there, whereas your conditional probability on the hypothesis that you make the both choice is low. So uh, if you do the weighted average this way, then you get the choice, pick both boxes, having much greater expected value, assuming that you like money. Uh, and that's really all that matters in this case. Uh, on the other hand, if you go with the causal decision theory um, uh, version, then um, you get a contrast between what you would think if you learned. Suppose you, you made your choice and you woke up and you forgot what you choose. And you say, what do I hope I chose? And you say, well, I hope I chose just one box um, because then I probably will get the money. But if you are actually faced with a choice, according to the causal decision theorists, you should go with the choice of both uh, boxes because uh, the counterfactual, since it's counterfactually independent, whether the money's there in your choice, you can say, suppose I'm the one box type, then if I chose two boxes, then I will choose maybe, I'll probably choose one box, but if I were to choose two boxes, I would do better. So you have a dominance argument uh, because of the causal independence of the assumption. So on the, on the, on the assumption that the money's already there, uh, if, um, if, if, if the money is there, then I do better to take both. If the money's not there, I also do better to take both because I got a thousand rather than zero. Uh, so you have a kind of dominance argument that, that we don't have to worry about whether the money's there in terms of assessing the rationality of uh, of the choice. Um, okay, so you know, people, I mean, you can sort of give various thought experiments and arguments, making it plausible that the choice should be one way or another. Um, one could say, suppose you're making the choice, and I'm sitting here. I'm your advisor, and I can. The box is transparent. Uh, both boxes are transparent in this direction. Uh, but opaque, one of them, in, in your direction. So you can't see whether the money's there, but I can. But I'm not allowed to tell you. But I am allowed to give you advice. Okay, so what advice am I going to give you? I look in there, I see the money, I say, take both. I look in there and I see no money, I say, take both. So you don't need an advisor. You already know you should take both. Because that's what a, a, a person who has your interest at heart, who knows more than you do, would tell you. So, uh, you know, there's the argument of that kind in, in defense. Other arguments that look, uh, notice that the uh, one boxers all get rich and the two boxers don't, so uh, uh, wouldn't it be better to be one of the rich people? Uh, and the one, two boxer says, uh, yeah, it'd be nice, but I happen not to be, it's, that happens not to be an option open to me because I'm not that type. Um, Okay, so that's, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the contrast. Now, when you, um, you can think about, I'm not gonna go, uh, I wanna use the Newcomb problem mainly just to illustrate the contrast between, uh, between the two, um, two views. Now, a game, 
has, even though game theory developed somewhat independently of uh, Bayesian decision theory, um, it still used the notion of expected value, although uh, using objective probabilities uh, the way it was thought about. So a game is a sequence of interacting decision problems. And in defining a game, unlike defining a Bayesian decision problem, you don't specify, you specify utility values for the outcomes of the game, but you don't specify for the different players, but you don't specify the probability values. So the idea is supposed to be uh, what you know about things you don't control are um, what you know is, um, um, is what the other person's values are. So you know the other person is going to act rationally. So if you figure out what's the rational thing for the other person to do, then uh, you can predict that the person will do that. Or if you think it, it's probably more, ra probably the person's rational choice is this rather than that, so probably they'll do this rather than that. Um, 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 and uh, so you base your your decision on, again, what corresponds to states of the world are other people's choices. What corresponds to your choices are the options available to you. So the specification of the game specifies options for the different players and, uh, and doesn't specify what you believe about the other players in a quantitative way. It just specifies that you believe they're rational. So, best way to think of game theory, I think, although it wasn't originally thought of in this way, is as a uh, partial specification of a sequence of decision problems. Uh, you can define a model for a game which fills in the rest of what you need to know to determine what's rational to do, namely beliefs or credences that you have in the other person's actions. Then you, add a, you could add a general constraint on the theory, but let's suppose that you know, or that it's common knowledge, or other assumptions you can make, that all the players act rationally. Then you can say, what kind of model of a game would, uh, what would people do? What are the constraints on what people would do in some model which meets that constraint? So that's the sort of Bayesian way of thinking about the application of uh, of game theory. Um, now, a game generally will be um, defined by a tree structure where you label the tree by the player. So player A gets to choose left or right, player B gets to choose left or right, and then player A gets to choose again. And then in all the possible final outcomes, you put in a utility value for each player. And then you think, what will the player do given that they're rational? And you say, well, it's clear enough what A will do if he reaches that point, but maybe he won't reach that point uh, because maybe B will choose here. So in order for A to figure out how to assess the difference between the best value here and compare it with the best value here has to make a prediction about what B will do. And that prediction can be based on what A knows about what B's values are. So we have to think what will B get if, um, if this is the outcome versus what will B get if one of these is the outcome. And say, well, player B's choice, be given that player B is rational, will depend on that utility. So player A uses B's values to predict, make an epistemic uh, commitment, and uses uh, her own values to predict, uh, to choose which of the options, and so the interaction of those, those kinds of things. Now, uh, so you can add some further complications which involve, in order to get more interesting games than the, the pure uh, perfect information games, which involve uh, a, a further consideration of causal independence. I mean, the point is here we already have in the tree structure some assumptions about causal independence. Um, nothing B can do will affect what A did first, uh, but what B can do will affect what A does next because A won't have a choice. Or even if A did have a choice, a further choice, uh, B can affect uh, 
uh, A's action by choosing something because A will choose one thing uh, one way if he's here and another way if he's there. So you have causal uh, structure built in to the story. Now you can add um, um, a, an assumption that A has to make her last uh, choice should she get there uh, in ignorance of what B did. So this is an assumption of causal independence is to say we can add a, a constraint, a so-called information set, which says A's choice is counterfactually independent of B's choice. So A doesn't have the option of choosing this on this um, uh, possibility and that one on that. These are B-linked. So this is a single choice point. A can either choose to go, uh, to go left, uh, whichever place he is, or to go right. And that's an assumption of causal independence. So the, the definition of a game builds a lot of causal structure. And that causal structure plays a role in determining what the options, uh, what options are available to the player and what the consequences of the actions, uh, the way in which they depend on um, each other. So what, after defining games in this extensive way but with tree structures, um, Von Neumann and Morgenstern, when they first invented uh, game theory and developed it in the 40, 1940s, um, suggested that we can give a more abstract formulation of the theory, the so-called normal or strategic form of the game. And I'm going to talk next time some about strategies. Um, but um, 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 a game in strategic form is something that looks more like one of these matrices. So um, we might have um, Um, a will have three strategies, say, and B will have four strategies, although that's not this game. In this game, A has um, either the strategy of go left first and uh, right second and so on or, or whatever, and B has the strategy, just, just one choice or in the simple game. But in a game with many moves, your strategy will be a choice at each possible point that might arise. So you can say, what, and this is the way um, von Neumann and Morgenstern justified the, uh, the, the, the idea that the strategic form represents all you need to know to determine what's rational. They say, suppose you're, play, you're gonna play one of these games and you know perfectly well what the tree structure is, but suppose instead of playing the game in real time, uh, we say, the, we have a referee, and you are to turn in a strategy to the referee saying what you would do in each of the possible circumstances that might arise. So what would you do uh, if, if you reach this choice point, and what would you do if you reach that choice point, and so on. It's for every choice point that you might face, you, um, uh, you choose one of, the, uh, um, one of the one of the options, and that's a strategy. So a strategy is a complete specification, not only of what you will do, but everything you would do if the occasion were to uh, arise. So again, a counterfactual uh, built into the characterization. So the idea is that, that uh, in an ideal situation, choosing a strategy is rational if and only if making the choices dictated by the strategy would be rational in each uh, situation that, that were to arise. Um, so uh, we could play the game uh, in this boring form where you turn in your strategy first um, uh, and then the referee plays out and says here's the outcome. Right? And, uh, so here the idea is if you represent it in this matrix form we have a very clear representation of cause, all the causal complex causal interaction it is sort of reduced to the dispositions that the player has at the start of the game. 
And so the idea is that the game would unfold by perfectly rational players in exactly the way that will yield um, um, a decision made in, in this form, strategy choice form. So the idea is that here, and to put this into the more uh, Lewis and Savage way of thinking about decision theory, for Alice, um, these are her options and these are her dependency hypotheses or states in Savage's sense. These are the facts that Alice can't control, namely what Bert's strategies are. And similarly, Bert's actions treat these as, uh, as um, states. So the sort of state action um, contrast in the, um, in, in the classic versions of decision theory are reflected in the, uh, in the game. So again, causal independence and we sort of, and also the idea that the world unfolds in, as a result of the dispositional states that it has at an earlier stage. So this sort of dynamic pattern uh, is, some, is, is reflected in a static version of, of, of the game. Now there's a lot of controversy, uh, and in particular, enormous idealization needs to be made to get the equivalence of the normal form and the strategic form. In fact, in playing out in real time, you don't make hypothetical decisions about what you would do in situations that aren't gonna arise anyway. You'll make them as you go, it's much more efficient. But the extreme idealization of the theory just sort of abstracts away from all that. So in particular, if you were to think of chess uh, as a game, and it, with, a, with a definition, there are, um, each player has a certain number of complete strategies. And the number of strategies that each player has is greater than the number of atoms in the universe. Right, so uh, if you weren't uh, making sort of the assumption of logical omniscience, perfect computational uh, power, um, uh, nobody could ever play uh, a, a game in strategic form if the game had any complexity uh, at all. In fact, from an ideal point of view, chess is really not that different from tic-tac-toe. Because tic-tac-toe, you really could spell it out. The only difference is chess is more complicated. And so it's harder to figure out uh, what the ideal strategy is. Uh, and in fact, it's even harder to figure out theoretically who has the ideal strategy. So it could be that uh, white could always win in chess um, if he played ideally. And it could be that black could always win or it could be that it will always be a draw, probably the la last. But, um, uh, but there's some games where if you go first, you lose, and uh, if you play ideally, and the other player does, uh, and, and others where if you go first, you get to win. Um, so the idealization is uh, ridiculous uh, in, in some ways, but still the, uh, the games we look at in order to reveal certain features of strategic reasoning are often simple ones where the idealization is not so uh, extreme and one can learn something about strategic reasoning generally from those, um, from those kinds of, of, uh, of games. Um, okay. Um, all of these um, ways of thinking about decision theory and all the ways in which causal structure is, is built in involve this kind of tree structure, branching structure of some kind. And um, this applies to chance as well because you can think of chance, a chance model, uh, as an evolving sequence, say, of, of events where chance changes as we go. A uh, chance model as a kind of special case of a game, a degenerate case of a game where there are no players other than nature. Uh, but you have the same branching structure with a chance here and then a chance there and so on. Uh, probabilities assigned to the branches in the, in the tree. So the branching structure together with some further assumptions about causal independence play a central role in the characterization. But um, 
the question, the sort of general problem I wanted to raise about determinism is how do we fit this sort of branching idea, this idea that there are alternatives at various points in the course of a sequence of events with determinism? Um, David Lewis asks us to consider, um, and this is a, a general problem, not about games, but about, or decisions, but about uh, the relationship between counterfactuals and determinism. David Lewis asks us to consider, and this is the last page of the handout, a counterfactual that supposes that some ordinary actual event did not happen. There's a, a, an antecedent, counterfactual antecedent about an event, any event. Suppose I had not blinked at a particular time uh, when I in fact did blink. Determinism seems to imply that the counterfactual world which I choose, or the counterfactual worlds that I choose, the closest ones in which I blink, have to be either ones where the history, the, the events in the past were different all the way back in some respects. Because if they ever were the same uh, at some point, even no matter how far back, then uh, determinism would say that I blink would entail that I blink, assuming the laws are true. So either the world was different all the way back through time. If I had blinked, things would have been different a million years ago. Or an, uh, an event is, uh, 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 a law of nature is violated in the actual world. If you then think of this in terms of action, you think, what? When I'm choosing whether to do A or B, do I have the option of falsifying a law of nature? Um, or do I have a, um, the option of altering the past? Because this is it true that if I were to make the alternative choice from what I'm going to make, uh, then the past would have been different or a law would have been uh, broken. Both of them seem gro grossly implausible. So there's a question uh, there's a tension between a kind of law-based theory of the causal structure of the world and uh, which in some ways one thinks that determinism is sort of you can't change anything without changing everything. Right? There's, there's no sort of uh, ways to divide things up in the way in which counterfactuals seem to require that you do. And the problem is particularly acute when we're talking about what we regard as free uh, human uh, action. And this is a real puzzle, uh, I think, and I don't know exactly what the general response to it should be, but I do want to suggest that at least intuitively the distinction concerning causal independence uh, it is not incompatible with determinism. So I use this little example to uh, illustrate uh, this. Alice accidentally dropped a flower pot out of the window, third floor window, in exactly the moment when Bert was passing by below, so it hit him on the head. Few people walk by this street, so it was a rare event that there was someone there. Uh, rarely does Alice drop a flower pot. I mean, she just happened to this one time. So it was a remarkable coincidence that Bert just happened to be there at the wrong time. It seems intuitively clear, if one just thinks intuitively about counterfactuals, that if Bert had left on his walk just a few minutes later, then the flower pot would not have landed on his head. Because the way we've told the story, Alice's uh, if, uh, event was independent of, of, of Bert's, causally independent. That's to suggest that the causal chain leading to Alice's dropping the pot would still have been true in the counterfactual world which we de define as the one that, that would be if Bert had left uh, on his walk a little earlier. Now, this assumption about the causal chains is wholly compatible with determinism because um, uh, what determinism says is the whole history of the world, uh, if it were the same at some earlier time, then that means 
Burt's causal chain and, and the causal chain leading to Burt's being there and the causal chain leading to Alice dropping the pot would each be determined, even though completely independently, uh, by the same uh, global state uh, of the world. But that's compatible with saying that nevertheless the chains are different. So that kind of, it seems the idea of holding certain things fixed and not others is perfectly compatible with, uh, with determinism. But if we push further and ask the following question about the relevant counterfactuals world uh, in which um, um, Bert left on his walk a few minutes earlier, would the chain of causes leading to Bert leaving when he did have been different uh, uh, from what it was all the way back through time or would Bert's leaving for his walk a little earlier have been caused by a miracle in some have been, been brought about by a, by a violation of the law of nature. Something goes on in his brain that slows him down a little bit and he leaves a little later. Which would it have been? And we'll also say, well, that question just doesn't arise, right? In terms of what, what we care about is the causal independence of these two chains. Nevertheless, one might think on a, um, on a, um, a general account of counterfactuals that uh, uses these kind of modal resources, we're forced to answer, answer that um, question. And that's really um, the puzzle. What one would like is a way of saying that the problem just doesn't um, uh, arise. Now, Lewis distinguished what he called backtracking counterfactuals from the standard kind. So a backtracking counterfactual asks, if something had happened that didn't happen, why would it have happened? So we look backwards at the course of events that leads to the event rather than forward to what the consequences of the event um, will be. And the backtracking counterfactual uh, yields a different conclusion that's not compatible with what's led by the, uh, by, by the other one. So you know, about Bert, we could say, well, if he had left a little earlier, it probably would have been because the phone rang or whatever. I mean, you could say, or because um, some other distracting event um, uh, took place. But uh, we don't assume when we're looking forward to the, what would have happened at the occasion, we don't look to uh, this causal story. If we do look to the backtracking way and the forward-looking way with actions, we get something quite different. So if, if I choose both boxes, one can ask, what, uh, why did I choose both boxes? And I say, because I believe that if I had chosen just one, I would have gotten less money than I am going to get, even though I don't know how much money it is. It's probably no, nothing, you know, a thousand rather than nothing. But, um, but I know that I would have gotten more money than I, I uh, would get. So therefore, I chose both boxes because it would have been irrational for me to choose just one. But if you ask, if I had chosen one uh, box, why would I have chosen it? And I say, well, I would have chosen it because my values or uh, my reasoning would have been different than it is. Uh, that I would, have had, I would have been a different kind of person than I am. Or more, in terms of more realistic kinds of decision problems, I could say um, two questions I can ask. I can say, if I had, I, I made a choice, I decided to take the job rather than not to take the job. And you say, if you had decided uh, not to take the job, why would you have decided it? And I say, well, I, I would have had slightly different priorities than the one I have, the one I in fact have. I would have a different value. It still would have been rational, but it would have, would have been rational relative to a different set of beliefs and desires. So if you look in the backtracking way, you sort of the miracle, if there's a miracle, is not somehow I, um, I choose against my, um, uh, my, my beliefs, but rather my, my uh, values, but rather I would have had different uh, values. But if you ask why, uh, in the forward-looking way, why, what would, why did you choose this? I say, because if I had chosen otherwise, I would have acted irrationally. Uh, and that's when you ask about the Sly Pete case. Why did Pete fold? Because he knew it would have been irrational for him, because he would have lost if he called uh, and lost more money. So. Um, the backtracking way doesn't help us get out of the puzzle about uh, determinism. 
but uh, the, so that puzzle remains, and of course it's a familiar puzzle anyway, but I think it's some illumination to thinking in, in this broader context of a puzzle about counterfactual reasoning and not just a puzzle about, um, um, uh, about decision. There's also uh, an issue, I mean, of course, uh, one can try to defend a compatibilist solution um, to the problem of free action, and, uh, but in doing so, one has to sort of address these broader issues. There's also a compatibilism alternative with respect to chance. So some people think chance, real chance, depends on fundamental indeterminacy, quantum mechanics or something. But, of course, the application of chance in science is heavily involved long before quantum mechanics is thought of in terms of statistical mechanics and so on. So um, determinism seems to be compatible with the scientific application of objective probability and explaining how that happens is part of the same pattern of, of problem. Okay, so it's kind of, I'm sorry to go way on so long, but um, next time uh, we'll look uh, at the general question of dispositional properties and then at, uh, look back at the game situation, the decision situation, and look at strategies as examples of a certain kind of disposition and, uh, uh, and uh, see if we can throw some light on these questions of uh, the relationship between dispositional properties on the one hand and decision uh, in, intention, intentions and plans on, on, uh, on the other hand. So thanks. Thank you. So, other questions? Maybe I start with a question and then I give them time to think about okay. their own question. Um, consider, let's consider again the Newcomb's um, um, problem. Because uh, when I, I consider this kind of example, I'm never, I'm never sure about what to think about it. On the one side, I agree with you that what seems to be rational is to take the two boxes because uh, we believe that counterfactually, whatever I do now um, is, uh, is not determined by and everything which happened before is causally independent mm -hmm. by what I'm doing now. But when we think about the example and the frequencies of, uh, <coughs> of the prediction of the person uh, together with the results, uh, we start to doubt that there should be some causal connection, mm -hmm. maybe a backward con uh, connection. Could there be a backwards, connect, uh, backwards causation? For example, can I, uh, or there is a forward connection, maybe the uh, predictor causes somehow what I'm going to do, let's say, or what I'm going to do may backwards cause what the predictor did. Right, yeah, yeah. So I was thinking, as the example is so complicated, uh, it seems to me that it allows for different uh, counterfactuals explanations of it. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted you to... Good, yes. So it's true that uh, when in applying in reaching the conclusion about the causal independence, um, one is not relying on some theoretical account of reductive or otherwise of the counterfactual. One is relying heavily on the intu intuitive judgments about causal independence. Um, now, the story is sufficiently um, bizarre in some respects that um, one can raise doubts on the intuitive level about the causal structure. So, um, as I say, we, we rule out crystal balls. We say this is um, 
uh, the causal explanation for the success of the predictor goes by a kind of common cause story, not by a kind of causal effect story. So it's that there are features of me and the way I have been uh, and the way I have, my attitudes and values have developed, um, which uh, as they were uh, at some past time and it took some tests, affected um, uh, uh, my results uh, on a test which, in which involved decisions, uh, but nevertheless decisions that have already been made, uh, and which then led um, to uh, the uh, results of the test being given to the predictor who assessed them and made a decision based on them. So the, um, something I did in the past played a role, or at least features of me in the past, maybe they just brain scans or something, didn't have to be decisions, led to um, two things. First, it influenced my choices, and second, it influenced the predictor. But no causal relationship between the two. It was like the case, say, of I, I bend a coin in a certain way to give it a bias, and then, but I don't know exactly what bias, and then I flip it a lot of times, and I base my prediction of whether the coin will land on flip number 17 on the first 16 flips. It's not that I think the first 16 flips have any causal influence. It's not that the bending changed in the course of this by the way it came up. It's rather that they give me information about the nature of the event, which also is going to affect the flip of the coin later. So uh, this kind of causal structure, uh, you have a common, uh, cause of things which themselves are independent at that point. Um, uh, so you want to specify, but you know, you can say, well, I'm not sure that's right. You know, I, maybe, maybe the story about um, how the predictor worked is not right. Maybe secretly the predictor has some his method of cheating. And so they're going to, uh, she's going to somehow sneak the money in there at the last minute if her prediction is wrong. Um, uh, and, uh, but you can still ask the question, don't, um, don't, uh, you can ask the conditional question, what would you think was the rational thing to do on the hypothesis that we have causal uh, independence? So in, in the, all the debates about Newcomb's problem and related uh, problems, um, one of the lines of thought is to say, let's try to make the example as realistic as possible. And so there's a contrast between extremely unrealistic versions of the example, which it seems hard to make sense of, except with some kind of science fiction. And then examples which seem more natural. Um, uh, but, and you know, there's therefore maybe not quite so decisive but uh, so, you know, some people assume, let's prove that the is perfect. Say, what do you mean perfect? Um, couldn't possibly make a mistake, or something like that. No, like, we can't assume that. And, uh, I just assume he doesn't, she doesn't make any mistake, or doesn't make very many mistakes. And it's best if it's only pretty probable. David Lewis argued that, uh, you know, the Newcomb problem may be a problem that never arises in, in real life, but uh, he argues that the prisoner's dilemma in game theory, under certain very not unnatural assumptions, is a Newcomb problem. Um, some people choose, in the prisoner's dilemma, choose to cooperate, others choose to defect. Um, you do better if both cooperate, worse if both defect, but uh, defecting is dominant. So it's like the Newcomb problem in that, in that respect. But if, so if you know that the person you're playing the prisoner's dilemma with is very much like you, but choosing independently of you, then you can take your choice as evidence about what their choice will be. And then you have something that's very much like a Newcomb problem. But it's sort of built into the prisoner's dilemma that 
it's causally independent. And Lewis says, of course, you know, Newcomb's problems may be rare in the form that they come, but prisoner's dilemma is all over the place. Right? This is a, a common structure involved in, which raises uh, puzzles about how people behave, but, um, or how they ought to behave and how they do behave. But nobody thinks there aren't plenty of situations which have the relevant features of the structure of, um, uh, of this. So um, the real, I mean, the, the defender of the two-box solution will grant that part of the motivation for the one-box solution is a kind of implicit magical thinking, as to put it tendentiously. Right? It's that you tend to build causal assumptions into robust correlations. And, uh, you know, you say, well, let's just, it's, 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 you would be making a mistake if you did that. Let's stipulate that. Then um, is it still a reason to uh, go by the epistemic connections, not by the causal um, connections? Now, the further thing, I mean, there's a further feature of this um, essential to it having the problematic features of Newcomb's problem, and that is that there's something less than perfectly transparent about rational choice. You can be in a situation where you learn something about yourself, about what you were. You don't make yourself into a certain kind of person, but you learn something about the kind of person you are by what you choose. But that's a familiar feature of rational action that's not perfect, right? It's not perfectly rational. So you say, what would you do if there were an emergency and you had to rush into a burning building to save a child at great risk to your life? Are you the kind of person who could do that? And I say, well, you know, I've really never been faced with a hard, a hard choice that demanded physical courage of some kind. I don't know how courageous I am. Um, but if it were to happen, I'd find out. Right? So I could say, and it, and it would be, partly be influenced by what it would tell me about that, because I would like to be that kind of person. And that's more Yukon problem kind of thinking. Right? So thinking well, uh, I, I want to find out um, if I yesterday was a courageous person, where I didn't get tested. And I may find that out partly by being courageous today. But in, in those kinds of situations, there's a mix of determining yourself, making yourself be a certain way, and discovering that you are that way. And Newcomb's problem is an attempt to bring out a way in which a choice can be purely revelatory of something over which you have no control. And that's a, that's a there's tension in our ways of thinking about action. Which, uh, which the problem brings out, and, and that's uh, and what's artificial about the case is partly um, trying to make it a pure case uh, where you separate what you cause or bring about by action and what you reveal uh, to yourself uh, about, uh, about action. So the epistemic and the practical um, mix in real life, but we trying to separate them here in a way which perhaps makes it artificial in that way. Hi. Um, my question is about the last problem you raised about determinism. And I thought that this problem could also concern the notion of similarity, because there is a clear tension, I think, between accepting determinism and uh, the requirement of similarity between words for oh. a counterfactual to be true. Mm -hmm. Because if uh, in the possible world the change that we require for having the antecedent true imply a change of the whole past chain, uh -huh. we cannot really say that is the most that is right, yeah, similar. Yeah. And I think that also the notion of small miracle by Lewis maybe is not um, it still implies quite a big change that maybe yeah. is not so uh, 
in, uh, in balance with the idea of uh, similarity between worlds. Uh -huh. So I'd like to know what you think about, yeah. about it. Good. Okay, so the first thing is, I mean, it's true that um, the tensions, there's always a case when some theoretical apparatus gives rise to certain problems. Um, I often feel, yes, those are really hard problems, and it's a benefit of my theory that it raises them. But another way of thinking about it is, these problems arise from your theory, and they wouldn't arise if we had some other theory. So it is um, a possibility that the tensions that Lewis brings out um, between uh, counterfactual supposition and um, the idea of altering the world in, in some respect, that that's the source of the problem. But um, then he wants to look at what the alternative is. Because Lewis makes a lot of very specific assumptions about similarity um, of worlds, which, um, uh, or, you know, then you could alter various, various things, but still think in the same, in the same way. But um, um, the, the, the general abstract idea of closeness, minimal difference, and so on, uh, which ju just absent any particular more substantive account of that, seems very neutral in, in some respects. So if the problem arises from this very neutral uh, framework of, uh, of semantics for counterfactuals, then it's much harder to see what the alternative would be. Now, I think there are moves one wants to make and, and one's, uh, presuppositions of the puzzle, the puzzle about determinism, which may be um, questioned. And one in particular, I think, is, uh, I mean, if you think in the kind of Lewis way, it's important that these worlds be worlds. They're complete, total characterizations of reality. I think it's much more natural to think of counterfactual situations as perhaps fairly coarse-grained partition of the space of possibilities. And when we say we want to hold the past absolutely fixed, we may hold it fixed on a coarse grain level. And so one, in particular, if you want to look at a statistical mechanics example of, um, of the branching kind of structure, we say we have a macro state partition, and we ignore the differences between micro states uh, within some say, set of particles in motion or something, ignore the, um, the, the local micro differences and just a, then we say we hold fixed the macro state all the way back, but uh, we don't hold the micro states fixed. And so we can have little changes in the world all the way back. This is somebody like, uh, people have argued that you can get around Lewis's assumption that the past has to remain fixed in this, in this way. So if the microstates were different but the macrostates were the same, you'd still get some divergences in later uh, macro states. So uh, one of the ways is uh, to, avoid, to try to reduce the tension is to think a little bit about coarser partitioning of possibilities. And the other way is to think about um, uh, that, that we're not going to get every antecedent, every potential antecedent being appropriate. So I want to say, we're, our logic has to say, take any proposition and we can suppose what if it were true. But it's all, if, you, if you focus on narrower range of, of actions, you get uh, a, of, of propositions uh, saying, well, we don't even know what to do with disjunctive antecedents or something like that, but we do know what to do with, with uh, action statements or something like that. Then um, uh, you may get a partial theory of the kind that uh, that uh, um, has, but you know, still they could say, no, I want a totally different way to think about counterfactuals, and um, you know, I'm going to say, well, I want to see that too, but um, I don't know what it is. That, uh
in your theory uh, of counterfactuals, you have the possibility that um, counterfactuals are neither true nor false. Right. And w what does this tell us about the notion of counterfactual dependence? Um, I mean, in a sense, uh, we think uh, as counterfactual dependence, dependence as something that is in the world or, uh -huh. or isn't. Yeah. But then the examples that, so, so the, the, some of the examples that you give, like the Bizet and Verdi case, mm -hmm. uh, these seem to have to do more with our description of the world. Uh, right. I mean, the, 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 the fact that they do not have a, Right. They're not yeah. true or false. Uh, do you think that uh, these features that the selection function is partial uh, tells us something about the notion of counterfactual dependence or it always concerns our, the way our describe, mm -hmm. we Good. describe yeah. facts? Yeah. Good. Um, yes, I think it does tell you something. And I think in particular, uh, if one looks at examples, there are two very different sources of truth value gaps in, uh, with conditionals. So in some cases, you want to say, you have chosen an inappropriate antecedent. Your antecedent is too unspecific. And that's, as you were saying, like the Bizet verity, like the, the disjunctive cases that raise, raise problems. Is, um, uh, so in particular, as people have emphasized, uh, even under the assumption of determinism, um, say de that coin flips are determined, we don't get a truth value for if I had flipped the coin, it would have landed heads. Because the idea is if I had flipped the coin, I would have flipped it in a very specific way. Which way? I didn't say. Right? And it's not part of my assumption that I was in. So if you ask the question, if you had flipped the coin, which particular way of flipping it with exactly what force would you have done? And we say, that question just doesn't make sense, right? I mean, that, that's, that, we don't, I'm not concerned with that. So um, one kind of case of, um, of indeterminacy or lack of truth value of, of counterfactuals arises from using inappropriate antecedents. And it's a major task to say what counts as appropriate in a given, in a given context, but it's still, uh, still there. Another Yet, this is still a, a separate uh, source, and that arises from chance. So you say, even if it were a genuine chance event, the flip of the coin, then even if I specified in as much detail as one could exactly how I would have flipped it, there would have been various quantum events that determined whether it landed heads or tails. I mean, there are these people like, you know, who, amateur magicians or professional magicians who are so have the, the skill of being able to flip a, a technically fair coin in such a way as to determine how it comes out. But um, uh, m for most of us, um, um, flipping it in the most specific way we could describe would still leave some chance, uh, chance left. So I want to say even in a case where an antecedent is appropriate for the context, um, it may be a context where uh, chance uh, is involved. And so the most you can say is, if I had flipped the coin, there would have been a 50% chance that it landed heads. And um, um, causal dependence, causal independence, is still involved very much in the chance case. So um, uh, if um, um, I say, if, I, if there um, um, two ways to flip the coin, but it doesn't matter, if I'd flipped it this way, it would have been um, a 50-50 chance. And if I flipped it that way, there would have been a 50-50 chance. Then it's the. Uh, flipping um, uh, the way of flipping is independent of the of the result. And similarly, if I say, well, if um, let's suppose take the kind of case Sidney Morgenbesser uh, talked about, where, where you say um, um, 
I'm asked whether I want to take a bet on a, on a flip of a coin. I reject the bet, but the, the offer of the bet I had was I could bet on, on heads. I said, do you want to bet on heads? And I say, no, I don't. They flipped the coin, it came up heads. And I said, if I bet, I would have won. I say, well, but if you'd bet, things would have been different. Say, well, no, the coin flip was independent of whether I bet or not. Now, maybe it wasn't. Maybe the guy would have made it come up tails if I'd bet heads. Um, but uh, under a normal course of events, where, where the, it's an ordinary coin flip, which maybe would have taken place whether I bet or not, somebody else was bet on it, but uh, then you can say, if I had bet on the coin, it would have landed. Um, uh, if I had bet on the coin, I would have uh, won. Now, I could say, well, there was a 50-50 chance of the coin landing heads. If I had um, uh, accepted the bet, there still would have been a 50-50 chance. So the chance was in causally independent. Uh, so, and that's um, when Dorothy Edgington uses these examples of counterfactuals uh, which are probabilistic, um, she's using the notion of causal independence in the, in the following way. I mean, he said, again, the example that the, the plane crash example we talked about, 85% uh, uh, of the people were killed. Um, and if, if she had made the plane, she would have been one of the people with, a four, with an 85% chance of being killed. So the, um, the chances of dying in the plane crash would have been the same for all the people on the plane if she had been one of them. So this is an assumption of causal independence which lies behind the judgment about a probabilistic. Uh, so in the case where the explanation for the indeterminacy is in the indeterminacy of the antecedent, we haven't been specific enough, you don't get, that's more like vagueness. We don't get probabilities. But we do get probabilities in the case where uh, chance is playing a role as well as a sequence of events, some of which are causally independent of others. So that's, the, I think, it, that's the way in which I think it does help to bring out the issues about in, uh, indeterminacy. Right Yes. Uh, just out of curiosity, uh, in the end you speak uh, uh, of this notion of backtracking uh, counterfactual. Of, of what? Uh, backtracking counterfactual. Oh, yes, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Um, do you think that we are also backtracking uh, indicative conditionals? That is, uh, consider Peter Key's. Uh, uh, we discussed yesterday the case of Pete the Gambler, you know. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, uh, in a way, well, you can consider a subjunctive version of uh, some of the conditional involved there, uh, a variant like uh, uh, if Pete had played, uh, that uh, uh, would be because he knew he would win. Yeah. Okay, something like that. Uh -huh. Okay, from which you can infer that if Peter played, uh, he would uh, he would win or he would have won. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. uh -huh. because knowledge is factive and so on. Now, uh, and you can also think of the indicative conditional: uh, if Peter plays, uh, he win. Uh, as uttered by Zach by the by one of the informer, the informer who know that Pete knows everything about the the hands, mm -hmm. you know, as kind of backtracking indicative conditional. But that's maybe mm -hmm. a kind of a fantasy. Good. So I think the um, the contrast between the backtracking and the forward-looking counterfactuals is very, um, it's very clear one gets um, 
a distinction uh, where some, sometimes one may be true and the other false. In the purely indicative case, I think the line between forward and backward is much uh, less clear because um, the, the kind of forward, the sort of temporal structure um, of events is quite, is not involved in the epistemic relations between events. So I could, I mean, there is some constraint and then uh, on some views that you can't really know things about the future, whereas you can know certain things about, about the past. But um, uh, what you're holding fixed in the epistemic case is your knowledge. And um, uh, your knowledge may tell you something about the past directly. You don't need a backtracking special interpretation um, for that. So if, if as you, kind of the kind of example you're talking about, if, if I know that um, Pete sometimes um, uh, has an accomplice who will help him cheat and sometimes doesn't, and he doesn't play when he doesn't. And so what I know is that Pete has decided to play and so therefore, I know that he must have arranged to cheat. And that's a, uh, a past tense uh, inference about the past, but it's a purely uh, epistemic one. So it doesn't give rise to a different um, uh, uh, conditional. Um, but you, if you're trying to explain um, the fact, you might say, Pete wouldn't be playing if he hadn't um, arranged to cheat uh, as part of your explanation for why you know he is uh, going to cheat because he has chosen um, to play. But that's a counterfactual again. Or not a, uh, and so uh, backtracking counterfactuals are, are going to play a role in epistemic reasoning as are forward-looking. Um, kind of factuals, but uh, whether there's a distinctive contrast in the epi purely epistemic cases seems to me not not so clear. Yeah. Yeah. So I was wondering uh, something about the um, analysis of the similarity relation based on those of analysis of the similarity relation yes, uh -huh. between words. Um, based on, let's say, laws of nature or miracles. Because suppose I'm juggling a, a vase and someone, someone comes along and tells me, look, if you drop the vase, the vase would have broken. This counterfactual seems to be true independently of, let's say, whether determinism or indeterminism is true, but it's seems to be true just be because our inductive evidence tells us that uh, when a fragile thing uh, falls down, then it breaks. Um, on the other hand, suppose we are in a, say, lab and we are testing electrons, and I say if I had uh, fired the electron, it would have taken root B instead of root A. And at if indeterminism is true, or I mean, in this kind of setting, indeterminism or determinism matters uh -huh. for the truth of the counterfactual. So it seems to me that the kind of similarity re relation that becomes relevant in order to evaluate counterfactual depends on the uh, communicative context in which counterfactual are asserted, because sometimes laws of nature are you need to take into account laws of nature in order to determine whether the counterfactual has a certain truth value. But yeah. most of the time, you don't need to evoke uh, metaphysical pictures such as, uh, let's say, determinism or indeterminism in order to say, look, what you said is true or false, or, or look, you said mm -hmm. something false. So mm, to what extent do you think, the, let's say, metaphysics of uh, laws of nature and uh, is, yeah. is relevant. In Good. So even on, on Lewis's view or anyone's, um, even though Lewis wants to say laws of nature get broken in counterfactual worlds, um, 
they got to be broken in little ways, which means in effect, I mean again, for Lewis a, a law is just a global description, but if you think of a law as something that applies locally in some way, then you can say you do assume that the laws continue to hold um, even in under counterfactual um, circumstances, in a sense that um, 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 the adding an exception for the antecedent, it, it's still going to remain uh, true. Now, of course, the laws can be indeterministic uh, on certain theories and or certain assumptions and. Um, uh, that gives you a little bit more flexibility in some ways uh, in that um, it could be that the very same laws uh, hold um, but different things happened even in the local situation in question. But uh, either way you're going to get causal independence playing a central role in that even under, in, I mean, uh, we talk about, say, sending a laboratory ex quantum mechanical experiment or something like that when you, uh, you do some, um, um, uh, some, uh, uh, some putting a particle through some mirror or something like that. Um, uh, you could say, well, if I had, uh, done it a minute later um, in exactly the same condition, that is, I, 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 uh, I repeat the test conditions perfectly, uh, it still might have landed, uh, might have uh, occurred differently. Right? Uh, but you also say that if I sent two uh, uh, particles uh, and uh, in different directions, and I say if I'd not done this one, uh, that one would have been the same. Well, then you have special quantum mechanical problems where maybe that's not right. So the whole idea of causal independence um, is problematic in its application to some kind of situations in, in scientific things. So, you know, that's, that's um, uh, that gives rise to controversy of interpretation of the uh, scientific um, theory. So um, one hypothesis is that there are lots we assume about the causal structure uh, and it works well on the macro level, uh, those assumptions. Uh, and they, the world answers to them, so they're, they're true, and so, and so we should be realist about it, but they're not fundamental, and that maybe those very structures break down uh, at, at, a, at, a, at, a different, at a different level. So I think the um, wants to be open to the possibility that some of the um, robust intuitions we have um, about causal structure and counterfactual dependence and independence are going to uh, be called into question by a scientific theory. Any other question? I maybe ask a question about um, the relation between determinism and uh, causal independence, uh, because difference between the, uh, the, the relation between uh, not the difference, the relation between determinism and causal independence, right, yeah. mm. um, because it seems quite evident that if we consider two events locally, we can consider them to be causally, completely independent one of the other. Uh -huh. But if we start to, cons to uh, amplify our uh, considerations, uh, even the two events which are considered locally independent,
may have uh, some, or either a common cause uh, or some, uh, some connection, some causal connection uh, mm -hmm. in the past, uh, in the very past, uh, even centuries, uh, going back to predecessors and something like that. So, can, if we consider this kind of situation, can we really maintain that determinism is compatible with causal independence? Um, it's, yeah, um, good. <laughs> so, um, of course, it could be causal chains intuitively um, separate and then come back together in some, in some cases. So um, even if it's clear that there's no sort of conspiratorial story of how it is that Alice happened to drop the flower pot just when Bert was passing by, one could say, nevertheless, Remember back 40 years ago when, when um, 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 Alice uh, actually met Bert and they talked to each other and uh, were influenced by each other in certain respects and that played some role in the rest of their lives which led to this, this event. So then you, that's a kind of case where, I mean, I, I, I think um, uh, one still wants to talk about causal independence and that it was a coincidence that an earlier event set off a sequence of events in two different ways that led back together again in this uh, way. But it's, I think it's right to raise um, a, a question about how to deal with the difference or how to explain the difference between um, um, a story for a coincidence using coincidence in the neutral sense of two events coming together in some way uh, an explanation that is really no explanation at all for why this and that happened at the same time. Um, uh, and an explanation which um, does explain why these two things happened at the same time. And that's an interesting question about the nature of, uh, of exp explanation. But, um, but you know, to say why, why did why did the flower pot drop just at this moment? Uh, the intuitive answer is, in the case I'm thinking of, it just was a coincidence. There's no further story to be told. When well, we say, well, wait a minute, we can tell a completely good story of exactly why she did what she did at the time, and a perfectly good story of why he was there just at that time, and put those two stories together, and you have an explanation for why they happened at once. Right? They say, yeah, but that doesn't answer my puzzlement about why they happened at the same time. Right mm -hmm. And I think the reason there is puzzlement is because, uh, and then again, this is an epistemological point, but um, when there are alternative hypotheses in play which come to mind and are, and one wants to rule out, um, that makes coincidence seem uh, in need of explanation and the explanation might be no there isn't any explanation. So it's the same way if we if you flip the coin 20 times and it lands heads tails heads tails heads tails heads tails I say why did it do that for 20 times? Say, that was enormously improbable and I say yeah everything every sequence of 20 flips of a coin is enormously improbable uh, why is this one any worse than any other? Um, and the answer is because uh, normally when things go in sequence, heads, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, there's some explanation 
for why they're not independent of each other. Uh, but, you know, sometimes there isn't. And you can say, no, it was just luck. It was just chance. Or 20 heads in a row or whatever, same thing. Um, so I think the, one does want a good account for one's epistemology and one's metaphysics of what the difference is between a, a coincidence um, and an explainable uh, con convergence um, and why um, it counts as a surprising coincidence even if the right explanation is that's just the way it is. So, but as I say, as I say, you could have a common cause which really was still just a coincidence of the kind you're suggesting. Mm -hmm. Any other question? They probably it was a difficult topic. We will think about it uh, tonight, and that maybe tomorrow we will raise some other questions. Thank you very Good. much. Okay, thank you. Thank you.